Hey guys, hey, it's uh, Dr. Jerry here with Mills Chiropractic and Wellness Center. And, uh, you know, last month we did a presentation on inflammation and uh, had, a, had a great turnout, but it, it uh, led to a number of questions and I didn't get to uh, adequately address this uh, question during our presentation. So I thought I'd do a quick little webinar on um, how to pick a good high quality fish oil. And so, you know, I, I, there's primarily six factors that, that I tend to look at when I'm trying to choose a good fish oil. And, and we're going to run through these in what I believe is the order of importance, but not necessarily the order that I'm going to look at the fish oil, right? And, and this will make more sense as we go through. Now, the truth is that finding high quality vitamins um, at a fair price is extremely difficult. Look, I've studied nutrition uh, for years. In, in fact, I'm actually board certified uh, to get my diplomate in nutrition. Um, I'm certified in functional medicine. And um, it, it's difficult for me, to be honest, on trying to select a good high quality uh, fish oil um, and, and selecting any high quality vitamin for that matter. Um, and so I, I mean this with no disrespect, um, but you know, I have quite a bit of education in this area and it's, it's difficult for me. And, you know, I really just feel bad for most consumers that go to the store looking to try to find, um, you know, a high quality supplement, trying to do a good thing. Um, cause unfortunately there's just so many really cruddy vitamin companies out there um, that are just looking to make a make a buck um, at the expense of your dollar but more importantly at the expense of your health and so you know I hope this kind of just uh, helps clear up some of that because there's also some really great companies out there um, and so you know I, I just kind of want to go through what I would look for when I look at official and so the first thing that I'm going to look at um, or look for in a high quality fish oil is purity. Um, I want to find a, um, a high quality fish oil um, that, like I said, is, is first of all going to do no harm. Like I said, there's a lot of bad companies out there and, and a lot of products that are sent to the market that, you know, quite honestly, um, should not be there. And, and we don't have time to discuss why this is allowed to occur and, and all of that. But uh, purity is a big thing, especially when it comes to um, to fish oil. Now, the trouble with purity and, and most vitamins um, out there it's, is, is that it's almost impossible to tell the purity um, by looking at the label. Um, now, there's a couple of things that you might look for on a label that kind of give you some, some clues, um, but they're really just clues. Um, and one of them is GMP certified. And GMP basically simply means that what's on the label is inside of the bottle. Um, believe it or not, um, a number of vitamins, and, and they've gotten better, but you know, a number of vitamins don't even have uh, in there what they say they do. So there was a study a number of years ago where they looked at vitamin D and had patients bring in their vitamin D uh, supplements. Um, and vitamin D is a relatively easy vitamin to make. It's a single vitamin in a, in a, in a pill. And uh, what they found is that a lot of the vitamins that they brought in had less than 50% of what the label said that it would have. So in other words, instead of it being 1,000 IUs, they were only getting 500 IUs out of that vitamin. And so GMP came along or this certification process came along and said, you know, we're going to standardize this. And, and in order to be part of it, to get the GMP symbol or seal on your labels, um, basically it means that, like I said, what's on the label is inside of there. And so, you know, that's at least a decent starting place that I look for with, with a vitamin company um, is that are they a GMP certified facility and a GMC um certified company. So at least I know what's on the label is in there. Um, it gives me some reassurance that it may be a quality uh, company. And if they don't have that, you know, I, I can quickly move on. Another uh, label that you'll sometimes see or certification is this NSF. Uh, basically, this deals more with the athletes. Um, and basically what it's saying is that there's not stuff in there that's going to cause you to fail a doping test. Um, there's some value to that. Um, you know, in our practice, that's not primarily what we deal with. Um, but that's what that label uh, stands for. So if you see that. Now, this new label that's uh, come up, um, our certification is USP uh, certified. 
and this one does carry some weight. Um, it's uh, what it's basically saying is that it's a GMP company, first of all, but also that it doesn't have any um, uh, toxins in there um, or at, at levels that are considered dangerous to people. Um, now, the deal with USB, and this is a, a great label, uh, but the deal with it is that it's a rather new uh, certification process and it's a rather expensive certification process. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of really good companies that don't have the USB uh, certification at this point. Um, really, it's only a couple of the really large uh, supplements companies that that have this because you know it, it is a rather expensive one but it is one that um, you will see on some labels at the store and it's it's one that would uh, give me um, some reassurance I guess that that we might be looking at a good product um, but for most of the companies out there what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to do a little bit of legwork because uh, yeah, and by the way, while I'm talking about these certifications, one of the things I do see at the store sometimes is these like fake certifications. Um, you know, they're designed to look like a official certification, um, but they're really just a made up certification by the company as a, as a sales ploy. Um, and when I see those fake certifications, you know, I quickly run away because I know that that's going to be somebody that's trying to uh, kind of game the system or, or cheat people. And, you know, I really want to have no business doing any business with them anyway. Um, and so watch out for some of those fake labels. That'd be one little thing I would tell you as well. But anyway, like I said, you're going to have to do some legwork on this purity thing. And and what you're going to have to do is, is call the company um, and ask for what's known as a certificate of analysis or a COA um, is, is kind of the, the short term for it. And um, all the companies have to um, have this certificate of analysis. Um, it's one of the rule changes, and I think it's a good rule change, but they have to keep it on each batch of product that they produce. Um, and so I request this certificate of analysis from each company, and they're gonna send it to you. Now, a couple of red flags too, when you do request this uh, certificate of analysis, is that if they're hesitant about it, um, or you know they they don't really want to send you one, or if there's if it's um, a you know a previously dated um, like you know it's a, over a year old or something like that, um, they're sending you that one because that was their best batch that they ever did. You know I want to see their most recent um, certificate of analysis uh, from their most recent batches so that I know you know kind of where they're at in this process. And sometimes I even may ask for for a number of those uh, certificate of analysis just to see kind of where they've been and where they currently are. Uh, with things. And so what the certification of analysis, though, is going to show us, it's going to come to you and it's going to have this official label at the top um, and depending on the company that did the certification and all of those things. But basically what's going to uh, happen is that they're going to send you this certificate of analysis. And one of the first things I'm, I'm going to look at is I always kind of jump to the middle section of it. And this is one that we have for one of the companies that we use. And so I'm going to look for heavy metals because um, I want to know that what I'm recommending or what I'm taking more, you know, as, as well, um, isn't full of toxins. You know, first of all, do no harm. And then second of all, be effective. Well, if you're doing harm, I don't care how effective it is. Um, and so we want, uh, obviously, as little um, of these toxins as, as possible. Now, unfortunately, we do live in a polluted world and uh, we can't eliminate all pollution, um, although I wish we could. Um, and there's and they've set, you know, what they consider safe levels. Um, now, the ideal levels, like I said, would be zero or as close to zero as you can possibly get. So, and I look at this, this um, COA, like I said, the first thing I'm going to look at is is it toxic or not? Um, if it is, um, you know, it, it obviously isn't isn't something I would want to take. Um, if it's passed, then then you know we might we might look onto a few things uh, with it. So then the second thing that I'm going to look for when I'm looking at uh, fish oil in particular is I want to look at freshness. Um, you know, oils have a tendency of oxidizing or becoming rancid. And this is a really bad situation and it, and it occurs a lot with fish oil uh, um, primarily. And so what happens though is when it becomes rancid, um, or it becomes oxidized, it actually becomes very pro-inflammatory to the body. And so it, it becomes anti what you're trying to do, right? Like, so you take fish oils to become less inflamed. 
and to deal with inflammation. But if the fish oil itself becomes oxidized or rancid, it becomes uh, inflammatory in and of itself. So actually you end up putting more uh, you know, fuel to the fire, if you will. And so freshness is, is like I said, is a big deal. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about freshness here in a moment as well when we start talking about quality. Um, but the nice thing with requesting that COA that you just did in the previous step is that that COA is actually uh, going to tell you about freshness when it comes to the fish oil. And so the freshness or the... Um, oxidation of it um, is going to be expressed as a peroxide value. And so if you look up towards the top of the screen there at this peroxide value, um, the standard for this is that it, it's less than 5 MEQs per kilogram. Um, and obviously we want it to be as, as close to zero as, as possible. And basically it's a measurement of how much oxidation and, and rancidity has, has taken place in this product during the manufacturing process. And, and so primarily it's a measurement of, of processing. And this is where we sometimes get into trouble too, is how is that product shipped to the store and how is it stored at the store as well? And so, um, you know, if it sits in a hot truck on a 100 degree day, um, there's a good chance that the uh, oils in there are going to oxidize at a faster rate. And so by the time you get it home, it may be oxidized. And so this is one of those things where um, uh, it's hard to, to test. And if you wanted to run your own independent test, you could. Um, or, you know, the companies that I deal with, I know how things are shipped. I know how they're delivered. It, and, you know, are they in cold packs and that kind of thing? Um, and do they do secondary testing? Um, these are questions that you'd have to ask the company. Um, you know, do they test it after it's sat on the shelf for a while? Or do they only test it during the batch run? Most COAs are only going to deal with the batch run, but you can get those secondary uh, assessments. If it's a reputable company, they, they oftentimes will do that. Um, and so if it checks out and the, the peroxide value um, is low, um, one of the other things that you're going to do is once you get it home, you're going to retest for freshness. And what you're going to do is just cut open a fish oil pill if it's in the pill form and smell it. It should not smell like stinky fish, right? If it does smell like stinky fish, those fish oils have become very rancid, um, most likely in the shipping process because if the COA said that it was good and then by the time you got it home, it was bad, and something something occurred along the way there. The other thing too is some companies will add an, a whole lot of like lemon uh, to it. Now lemon can be used as a preservative, but it can also be used as a way of masking bad fish oil or rancid fish oil. And so once it's kind of passed those first two tests, the next thing we're going to look at is is uh, potency. Um, and this is going to require us to read the label. Um, and so that we can start to figure out um, what we're actually getting here. Now, this is oftentimes where I'll usually start, to be honest, because I can usually eliminate most products pretty quickly by, by checking the label. Um, and uh, potency is an area uh, of much debate in the fish oil world. Um, experts, you know, we, we um, uh, sometimes have a hard time coming up with what's the right potency um, because it's it's an extraction of research. And on fish oil alone, there's been over uh, 10 to 20,000 research papers on fish oil. And, and this actually leads me to another point I want to make real quick while we're talking about it, um, where patients oftentimes will get uh, discouraged or confused, um, is when we start talking about the research um, of fish oil uh, specifically here. And so trying to determine what dosage, so when we do research or and when, when researchers do research, right, um, when they do it, what they're looking for is um, a particular type of fish oil at a particular dose and how it affects a particular condition. And so um, oftentimes what will happen, though, is that it will be a poorly designed research study, oftentimes is what I'll see, um, or they'll, they'll use a bad uh, type of fish oil or a poor dose, like a real low dose of fish oil, or too short of a period of time. And then it'll come out with this finding that says fish oil shows no benefit for XYZ condition. 
Well, that's not really what the research showed. What the research showed is that particular fish oil at that particular dose at that particular duration had no effect on the condition that they were studying. Um, and then somebody else will do another study with a larger dose or a different form, and they'll say, no, it works great for this XYZ condition. And so then patients are like, you know, the research says it's good. Some research says it's bad. What am I supposed to believe? I don't believe anything. I'm not going to do anything. Well, again, you, you, like I said, you kind of got to understand what research is actually good for and what it's not. Um, it's, it's very specific um, when it's looking at these things and these parameters. And that's why you can get conflicting data. Um, and so I, I you know, and that's the challenge, right? Um, that's what uh, we as practitioners have to try to do is kind of try to fish through that that research and understand what, what the research is actually saying. But unfortunately, like I said, a lot of times people will just read the headline or not even read the, uh, this is becoming very prevalent in social media now, where they'll read the headline of the study, think that they read the study, right? Um, uh, or they'll read the abstract and believe that they've read the entire study and um, never actually read what they were testing and just run with the, the headline of fish oil doesn't have any effect on whatever condition, Alzheimer's or whatever. Um, and then when you actually read the study, you realize, well, it's because they were using a very low dose of fish oil or something like that, because um, the next study will come out and say that it has a benefit. And that's that's where it, you know some of that comes in. And like I said, it, it gets, um, uh, is sensationalized, I guess, um, when we see those. So anyway, to kind of summarize this potency thing, um, you know, the, uh, there's thousands of research articles out there. And, and basically what I've kind of come to the conclusion of, and, and many experts in the field, um, I trust them on this as well. And, and they kind of suggest that, you know, if we're dealing with a chronic inflammatory condition, what we want to see is a DHA, we want to take a DHA level of over 1,000 milligrams per day and an EPA level of over 1,500. And so, and there's some upper ranges to this of, of you know, 2,000 for the DHEA and up to 6,000 for the EPA. But for the most part, to get a therapeutic dose, we want to be around 1,000 for DHA and 1,500 for EPA if we're dealing with a, a chronic inflammatory condition. If we're just taking the fish oil as a maintenance dose or kind of as a, a health preservation uh, mode or health maintenance mode, um, then what we probably want is around 500 milligrams of DHA and 500 milligrams of EPA per day. And so this is where, like I said, when we start looking at this, this label, this is where I um, tend, to, tend to eliminate fish oils pretty quickly. So when we look at the label, um, like I said, we're going to primarily, I usually focus on the DHA more than the EPA. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about this at our class, but the research is suggesting that DHA is probably more the, um, the value, if you will, um, in the fish oil. And so if we look at these two labels here, the, uh, the one on uh, the left here, the smaller one, um, it has, if we look at DHA, it says it has 240 milligrams of DHA uh, per serving. Um, the one on the right says that it has 390 milligrams of DHA. And so again, depending on what I'm trying to accomplish with it, um, it would tell me, you know, how many servings do I need to take to get to this level? And so when I look at this, the one on the right, um, if I needed to get over 500, for instance, I would need to take two of them. And the one on the left, I could take two servings as well. But then if I look up at the top of the supplement fact sheet there, it says a serving size for the one on the right is one. The one on the left over here is two, which means that in order to get to 500 DHA, I'd actually end up having to take four of the pills on the, on the left here. Um, and I don't like taking extra pills, um, and we'll uh, uh, kind of talk about this here in a second, but, you know, the uh, more pills that we have to take, the less likely we are to take them, and the less likely, likely we are to get to that therapeutic dose. But there's another important thing that happens with this. Um, so when we look at the total fat, and the nice thing with fish oil is pretty much what's in there is, is pretty much all fat. It's saying that two pills, for the one on the left, two pills um, is two grams of fat. 
Um, and we're only getting 240 milligrams of fish oil. And again, if I have to take four of those, that means I'm getting four grams of fat. Now, not that I'm worried about four grams of fat. That's not really that much fat. The problem is, is that the more extra fat that we have to take, the more likely that it is to become rancid um, or oxidized, and the more likely that it is to spoil faster um, and potentially cause more inflammation inside of our bodies. And so I can kind of quickly compare these two supplements and decide, you know, I'm probably going to take the one on the right would be the one that, that I may want to do my research. So a lot of times, like I said, I, I go to this step first because I can eliminate a lot of them pretty quickly. And then I decide, okay, well, this one may have some potential. Now let me go get the, the COA on it. Let me look into this one a little bit in more detail to understand what they got going here. Um, and so, you know, yes, I know that, that, you know, I just used some four letter words there um, called math that some of you guys are going to hate, but it, it does require a little bit of math in order to start to figure some of this out um, to, to figure out, you know, which fish oil to take. Um, the next thing I'm going to look at when I'm talking about fish oil is bioavailability. Um, and fish oils primarily come in three flavors. Um, they come in natural triglycerides, ethyl esters, and synthetic triglycerides. Now, generally speaking, the more natural that the food is or the more that it's in the, the, the state that nature created it, the easier that it is to absorb. And that's kind of what we find with, with fish oil as well. But there's some, some pros and cons to each one, and, and there's good and bad, right? Like, And so... Um, you know, the nice thing with a natural triglyceride, basically what a natural triglyceride is, is that they've just taken the fish and they've squeezed it out and the oil that come out of it is the oil that's in your in your fish oil pill. Um, and this is good except for two things. One is, is that it's really hard to get to therapeutic doses. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes you're taking like six, eight, 10, 12 pills to get to that therapeutic dose. Now it is easily absorbed which is good, but the bad thing with it too is that it's not purified. And so we end up with higher levels of, of heavy metals and PCBs, um, which kind of kicks it out of the list for my first two priorities is of, you know, is it safe? I want the lowest toxic level in my body that I can, that I can find. Even though I may absorb natural triglycerides far better, um, I just it's to me personally it's not worth the the extra exposure to the heavy metals in order to to get it in that form. And so that gives us to the second form, which is ethyl esters here. Um, oops, sorry, I slid past here. Um, and ethyl esters are basically a, a, the process of extracting the fish oil that we want, the DHA and the EPA, um, and getting rid of some of the other things that we don't. Um, and so it's a, it's a processing uh, thing in order to purify it and to concentrate it. Uh, the trouble with ethyl esters however, is that they're pretty poorly absorbed in the body. Um, in fact, it, it you know, the research has shown that it takes two to three times more ethyl esters um, to get to the same dose levels that we can get with a triglyceride form. In other words, we have to take twice as much if it's in the ethyl ester form. Um, and so, you know, while it is pure um, in the ethyl ester form, and we, we've usually been able to get rid of most of the contaminants, um, we have to take take a bit more of it. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of the research that's out there is done with an ethyl ester form. Um, so uh, mo that's one of the other things I always look at when I'm looking at these research papers is what was the form of the, the official that they were taking. Um, now, synthetic triglycerides, um, basically, what they've done is they've taken the nitrile triglycerides, converted it into an ethyl ester, pulled out the impurities, and then resynthesized it back into its triglyceride form. Now, it's not quite as good as the original uh, natural triglyceride form um, as far as absorption goes, but we get the benefit that it's now pure and clean, and it has relatively good absorption rates with it. Um, and so a lot of times I'll look for more of the synthetic triglyceride form. And there are some experts um, out there that certainly disagree and, you know, they all kind of get on their soapbox um, on, you know, which one's better and all of that. Um, based on the research that I've seen and that I've come across, and I don't really have a dog in the fight, like 
you know, most of them that have these strong opinions is because they're producing a product that's either an ethyl ester or natural triglyceride or synthetic triglyceride. And that's one of the things with vitamin companies. Um, you know, when you've been around them as long as I have, you quickly learn that they're all the best. Um, just ask them, you know, they'll tell you theirs is the best, right? Um, and so you kind of have to kind of fish through, um, fish through all that. Now, I would say if you are going to take an ethyl ester form, um, there's a couple of things that you should do. Um, you should take it, eat, you know, take the fish oil with a high fat meal. Now, of course, if you're taking 10 or 12 of them, that's a high fat meal in and of itself. Kind of a joke, but it is. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, take some digestive enzyme with it to try to help with that absorption rate um, so that you can get the most benefit out of it. Um, but again, oftentimes, because you're now doubling it, now we're um, back to that uh, potency issue with it. Um, and so I tend to favor more of this, the triglyceride, synthetic triglyceride form, um, as what I usually take and recommend. Now, sustainability. Um, this is a, uh, a thing that I, I do think that we need to pay a little bit of attention to. Um, it doesn't impact your current health with the supplement, but I think it's going to impact your health from a long-term standpoint because, you know, we've really polluted our, our world um, and we've, you know, over-harvested um, a lot of things. And so we've ended up, um, you know, killing off our oceans. And so, you know, I think if you're going to take a fish oil, you should take a, an environmental view of it as well um, and make sure that you're getting it from a sustainable source, um, right? So, you know, typically the smaller the fish um, is, the more sustainable it is, um, depending on uh, which ocean we're getting it from and those kinds of things. Those are all factors that, that you kind of need to look at. Now, to be honest, I don't really have the time to jump through, you know, what, how the, all those things. Um, what I look for is if it's a, a friend of the sea logo on there. If it is, I'm, I'm, I'm usually pretty satisfied. Um, however, I will say that if it is farm raised, um, that does create some issues. Um, so like farm raised salmon, for instance, um, has about 50% of the DHA EPA that a uh, wild salmon would have. Um, and so we really lose quality pretty quickly. Um, and then there is some, uh, uh, concern with, you know, are these, uh, farm, you know, fish farm operations causing more pollution than, than what they're protecting the wild, the wild fish from. And so, um, you know, those are some things to consider um, as well. And then the final thing that, that I'm going to recommend considering is cost. Um, you know, once you've kind of started to compare apples to apples, like if it's, a, if it's an ethyl ester, for instance, it's cheaper because it costs more money to turn it back into the triglyceride form, right? And so it's it's a cheaper form, but I also know that I'm going to have to take more of it to get the therapeutic dose. And by the time I do the math per pill, you know, it may be cheaper to do the, the, the natural triglyceride form or the synthetic form. You know, obviously the natural triglyceride form is going to be the, the least expensive option, but it's also usually the most toxic option. Um, and so it gets nixed from my list um, pretty quickly on that front. Um, so, you know, cost is a factor that you have to weigh so that you know if you're comparing apples to apples, um, you know, and how many pills are we going to take? You know, there's with some of the natural forms, you may have to take eight to 10 of those pills. Um, well, eight to 10 of them, even though it's cheaply produced and it's, but it's loaded with toxins. But on top of that, eight to 10 pills, you may go through the one bottle a week, right? Like, and so even though it was only $5, um, if you're going through a bottle a week, you know, that adds up um, over that, that month's period of time, you may have been better off, you know, buying a little bit more expensive one that's been concentrate, you know, concentrated or purified. Um, so, Cost does play a factor in it um, when it comes to making these decisions. So, you know, this I'm, I hope uh, uh, I answered most questions. Um, if you want to know which one I directly use, um, you know, please, please ask me in the office. I'd be glad to let you know. Um, I was trying to stay as neutral as possible because there are a lot of good products out there. And there's also a lot of really bad ones. So um, hopefully you're informed. Um, and if so, give us a like. And uh, next time we'll talk to you later.